Okay. All right, hi everybody, I'm Sandy. I'm a junior in college, and my major is anthropology, human biology, and today I'm talking to you about asparagus. Um, asparagus is a very common plant. Most of you have actually seen it before on your dinner table. You can find it in stores. It's part of the asparagaceae family. There's actually 200 species known out there, but we're familiar with one, which is this one. Um, and so today I'll be giving a brief overview of um, where it came from, botanical description, which means pest, harvesting, cultivation, traditional uses, such as a historic, the, um, traditional medicinal use of food, how chemicals and pharmacology we use it today, and biological activity including in vivo and in vitro studies, clinical studies, contraindications, that means anything they should probably be aware of if you're to eat asparagus, and also its current use in allopathic and complementary alternative medicines. So some interesting things about asparagus, the name's actually Persian origin, and it actually originated in the Mediterranean area, and so we, it's known that the Romans, Greeks, and Egyptians actually prized it highly, and then when Rome fell, it kind of became wild. It was brought to monastic gardens during the Middle Ages, and then the Huguenots brought it to France, and then the English brought it to the United States, and now we have it. It's cultivated all over New Zealand and the United States, and that's where you can find it in stores. Uh, we usually eat asparagus for the top part, as we're familiar with, the green spiry part. We chop off the base because it's very fibrous and tastes very good. So today I'll be talking something very interesting about how we've just begun to realize that most of the chemistry is actually in the base that we throw away. And I will show that through my biological activity and clinical studies. So first of all, asparagus is a very tall plant, it's about two meters tall. It has lots of leaves, but we usually cut it off before the leaves are growing or else it tastes very fibrous and gross. It's a perennial plant, it grows, uh, it takes about two years for it to grow into what we, can, what we call asparagus plant. We, it can grow up to about 100 years, but we usually harvest it in 10, 15 years because it starts producing all toxins and makes the field really like toxic and really bad for the plant. So it's not economically feasible to grow asparagus usually that long. And many pests include the fungi and asparagus beetle. It's because this pet plant is very, very picky. It needs very good fertilizers and good moisture control or else it'll grow off fungi. And some basic things they use to control pests include soap, which I thought was interesting because they call it organic way to control the problem. Also, traditional societies use ducks and geese to eat the asparagus beetle. And they also sprinkle lime on the plants to just remove the pests. And asparagus usually grows in warm climates like asparagus, where it's green throughout the year. But since the United States is temperate, as we know, it usually sleeps during the autumn and wakes up during the spring and continues growing. And like I said, asparagus requires high maintenance, not only when you're planting it for nutrition, but as well as harvesting, because it shrivels up very quickly and it requires high humidity, and it also has a very, very short shelf life. That's why it's so expensive. So some traditional uses is that it was first cultivated by Egyptians and Greeks. The raw one is known as asparagus racemus, which has the most antioxidants and most little chemicals in it, but we cultivated the, the um, officinal as one to have better taste. And like I said, it was brought to America by the English. And the Romans highly prized it because they used it for bee stings, toothaches, diuretics, sedatives, dropsy, and gravel. And in traditional Indian culture, it was used as fertility and protein to spermicide, which I thought was interesting. All three kind of covered each other. The Chinese used it to flush kidneys and prevent kidney stones. Well, what's interesting is that most like pharmacists actually kept the base of the asparagus to promote compassion and love. They gave the best stocks to their friends, which I thought was really cool. And in Indian culture, women, if they want to be fertile, they'll take the root for seven days and drink, and it's supposed to help promote fertility. We know asparagus for two varieties, the white and green one. The difference is that one was grown by sunlight. So you have kind of this white colorless asparagus, which I'll show later on. Um, it's got a more milder taste, but that means that there's less nutrients, obviously, because the more colors there are, the more nutrients and like keratinoids there are. We usually consume asparagus cooked, but it can be eaten raw, you dip it in dressing or something. And it has a very buttery taste, so it goes well in soup, goes well in like casseroles, you can basically do anything with asparagus. They can do other vegetables. And we can can it, we can make it into frozen, and what's interesting is that the seeds can be used to make this coffee-like drink, which I think is very interesting. So some basic chemistry and pharmacology. We all know asparagus to be the stinky um, vegetable that we eat, and then if you urinate it, there's this, this is compound that you distinctly smell it. It's known as mercaptan and thiols, which are high sulfur compounds, and so why we have that smell. Asparagus is very high in carotenoids, which are great for antioxidants. And it's a very similar biosynthesis pathway as paprika. Um, asparagus is very, very high in saponins that not only give it the characteristic of bitter taste, 
but later on in biological activity, it's responsible for many of the compounds that we see. Old asparagus, as I also understand, I mentioned earlier, is that once it goes past 15 years, it produces autotoxins that helps it fight against some fungi, but at the same time, it actually is all toxin to itself, which makes it even more toxic. So it's this vicious cycle that makes the plant more sickly and the feel very toxic. So that's why you cannot plant asparagus after 10 to 15 years. Most of the bioactivity is actually found in the base. And if you notice, all my studies I listed right here are all about very recent the last five years. And it's because scientists have only begun to recently discover that most of the chemistry is in the base. And it's why there are very few in vitro and vivo studies. Among the in vitro studies are prolytic pro pro properties, which is like the pineapple, papaya that we've learned in class. And it says that it can break down meats, but not as well as the papaya and pineapple. It can actually help with alcohol metabolism. That is, um, it can actually help the enzymes break down alcohol. So it can help with hangovers or just helping you break down for people who cannot break down alcohol. The opponents are responsible for many antifungal properties. And they're also good for fighting cancer. They've shown that the saponins can inhibit cancer cell migration. And it can also induce cancer cell apoptosis. And it targets the rho GDPase signaling pathway. Some in vivo studies is that found in mice is that it can be anti-diabetic. It can suppress the elevated glucose levels. And it can also suppress um, lipidemic effects, which cause like hypertension and high like, um, atherosclerosis. So there are very few clinical studies because they just began to realize that most activity is actually in the base. And that's why any clinical studies is right now they're still doing in vitro and vivo studies. What is known, however, is that asparagus is very high in folic acid, which is needed because it's actually used for amino acids, DNA, RNA, cell division, regulation of the nervous system, and the appetite. This is important because for women who are pregnant, they should be eating lots of folic acid so their babies won't have a um, neurotube defects or spina bifida. And so most doctors actually tell them to eat a lot of um, folic acid when they're pregnant, and asparagus is one of the ones that you, you can eat. And like I said earlier, there's very few um, clinical studies because of the whole base discovery. Some contraindications include that all foods, of course, some people will be allergic to some vegetables, and asparagus, of course, at least some people are allergic to it, although it's very rare. If you're allergic to asparagus, it actually is a very delayed reaction. You won't have it immediately, so it might, come, it might take up to a few hours. And it can range from just a mild food allergy to as much as suffocation you can't breathe, which is very serious. No one's really sure what the compounds are because they're just doing discoveries. But one of them, Hassan and Wolf, found that one of them is 1, 2, 3, triethane, 5 carboxylic acid. One interesting thing to, note, thing to know about is that if you have gout, which is basically um, like the buildup of crystal, uric crystals in your joints, you should be careful about eating asparagus. Basically, uric acid comes from the breakdown of purines, and purines come from 67% comes from your cell breakdown. It happens naturally. The other 36% actually comes from just your diet. So you should not consume things that are high in purines, like asparagus, if you have gout, because you will be in pain for a few days. So its current use in allopathic and complementary alternative medicine is that the supplements are still being used as spermicidal agents in traditional societies. It's still being used as antidiarrheal, antioxidant, antibacterial, actually um, liver protective properties, antioxidants, and many of the traditional societies I listed earlier, like India and China. In India, it's used for sexual potency, and China, it's used for diuretic and kidney stone prevention, and of course, the folic acid is given to most women, and I believe in terms of vitamin supplements, that's what issue comes in, the folic acid part. Otherwise, most of the chemistry I list are just being discovered, so there's not really much of a supplement for other things besides folic acid. So in conclusion, it's very good with this analysis. You can find it anywhere. It's on your dinner table. It's very common. It's a little bit pricey, as we listed reasons why. It's very picky. Um, there's two kinds of asparagus you can recognize it by. One's the white one, one's the green one. White ones taste a little bit better, it's a little softer, and the green ones are high in nutrients. It's high in folic acid, so women who are pregnant should be eating lots of it. Carotenoids are really good for the, um, the antioxidant parts. Its famous odor comes from where cactus and dials. So next time you eat asparagus, you know where it's coming from. And it's traditionally used in, um, for medicines such as diuretics, spermicide, kidney stone, prevention, and potency, which I think is interesting. The potency part is spermicide, kind of, kind of opposite of that. And it's been shown that in vivo and vitro studies show that it's great for alcohol metabolizing, it's great for the tumoral, antidiabetic, antibacterial, hypolytemia, and antifungal. And more research will be done in the future about the base. We usually dust guard away. And that's all for my presentation. These are all my sources. Thanks, everybody.